Hi out there in podcast land. This is Craig with the Front Row Network, your pop culture hub for NPR Illinois Community Voices. And I'm so excited today to bring you this amazing interview from uh, these two artists that in their own rights that were able to bring together this amazing book called Masters of Makeup Effects, A Century of Practical Magic. You've heard me chat with Howard Berger before the Academy Award-winning makeup effects artist, also current governor to the Academy Board. And we chatted uh, earlier this summer kind of about his career and how he came to be a makeup effects artist and some of those amazing stories that he was able to share with us. So certainly go back and listen to that interview as well. But today we're also joined by his co-author, Marshall Julius, who really finds this passion for film at a young age and then uses that to not necessarily enter in the industry from the production side, but more from the film film critique side. Uh, He becomes a film critic and he brings that love and that fandom into his work. And so they have put together this amazing book that really is not necessarily a how-to or a history of makeup effects. It's truly conversations with the professionals, with people, even uh, not just makeup effects artists, but also actors and directors and editors and people from all over the industry, producers that allow you to get this amazing perspective in the story, the truly the story behind makeup effects in Hollywood. And so it's incredible. There, there's something for everyone in here. It literally covers any area of makeup effects you would absolutely think of. Uh, and it's just going to be great to have a conversation with the two individuals that helped put this together. It was kind of a pandemic project. You'll probably hear a little bit about that in the interview as well. And we're it's kind of nice to have something uh, great come out of the pandemic. And this is something that I can't uh, recommend enough. It's certainly available now. So you can go and check out uh, and make sure you can get any kind of pre-orders or you can get just your order placed at independent bookstores and also online. But it's Masters of Makeup Effects, A Century of Practical Magic. And I am going to dive right into the interview now with Howard Berger and with Marshall Julius. It is such an honor to be able to bring back to the show Howard Berger and his co-author, Marshall Julius, who just put this new book into the world, Masters of Makeup Effects, A Century of Practical Magic. And it's just an incredible triumph of a book. But welcome to both of you today. We're excited to have you. Thank you so much. And and yeah, that book, the book title is a mouthful. At times, I even stumble over the the title of the book. But uh, yeah, no, thanks for having us on. It's, It's great. And, you know, Howard, you and I had such a a wonderful chat uh, a couple of months ago, and it's so great to get you back onto the show. And then Marshall, learning about sort of your prolific nature in being able to dive into films as a film critic, but then also the books that you've written. It's just so impressive. And we're so grateful to have you on, too. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having us on and giving us a chance to talk about the book. It is a mouthful. I got to say, sometimes um, when we do the Masters of Makeup Effects hashtag, sometimes I just write Masters of Makeup and, and then it's like, I look at it, I think, is that right? And then, no, no, it's Masters of Makeup Effects. You don't have to do the Century of Practical Magic. That's sort of like the suggested second bit of the title. It's sort of like a person's middle name. It's up to you if you want to include it. Well, I'll tell you what, I we were grateful. Uh, I was grateful to get a copy of the book, and it really has everything in it. I mean, it is incredible the amount of research that went into this book, and it's really, truly a triumph to bring this particular craft to people, to cinephiles, to people that are just interested in potentially going down a career path here. There's a lot of different avenues to this book. Howard, are you just excited that it's getting out there into the universe now? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we started working on this April or March or April of, of 2020, you know, when the pandemic hit and I had no excuse not to write a book with Marshall. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, we've been waiting and waiting for us, for Marshall and myself. It's been part of our lives for the last two years. And so, um, yeah, it's really exciting and great. And and I, and I think, you know, when Marshall and I first talked about writing a book, we had a whole bunch of ideas and then we, we, we narrowed it down to this concept, which, you know, I knew I didn't want to do a, a how-to book. I didn't want to do something that was really procedural. 
but I wanted to tell stories, but I wanted them all told first person, you mm -hmm. know, opposed to me like relaying or Marshall and I relaying stories. These are from the, you know, these words are out of the, the people's mouths, our, our collaborators, you know, from Rick Baker to, you know, uh, Kevin Yeager to James McAvoy to, you know, John Landis. So it's very exciting. And getting to hear their stories and, and then how we broke it all down into different chapters. That was the other thing too. We wanted everybody to be spread throughout the entire book. I, we didn't want to do like a chapter on this guy or a chapter on, on this person or a chapter on this person. We wanted to like make it really, really, uh, you know, uh, a giant collaboration. So everybody has stories throughout all the chapters and photos. And I think that's been the big surprise for people that knew nothing about the book, including my wife. And also my business partner, Greg Nicotero, like I gave him a copy and he was like, it's totally what I didn't expect. It's so magnificent. It's so wonderful that he bought 20 copies oh, to, that's great. To, to hand out to people and friends. He's really, really happy with it. And, and he's, he was one of my biggest, um, I, I'm not, I don't want to say worries, but I was most concerned about what he thought because he, he can be very critical. He's very smart and has a great eye and, and a great brain. And, um, he really, really liked it, which gave me a lot of confidence. I mean, I had confidence in it. Anyhow, I looked at it and I'm like, this is a great book. Uh, but between uh, Greg and my wife, Miriam, those two were my harshest critics. And uh, and John Landis, we're also, we yeah, haven't shown John, it to him John, yet. John hasn't seen it yet, but John will let us know. You know, like, <laughs> he'll start it. like I don't understand why you did this. This makes no sense. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yeah, no, John. No, right I'm waiting that. to hear what John Landis has to say about it. But I, yeah, I think, I think Landis will not have complaints about it. So, which will be lovely. So, but uh, he'll be supportive. And he was very supportive in the writing of the book. So um, amazing. Yeah. And now, that, yeah, that's the other thing too. So, I'm sorry, uh, real quick. What we did is we interviewed everybody for about two hours. It was over almost 70 people. And then Marshall transcribed everything, pulled out all the quotes we were going to use for the book. And then we sent those, each person's quotes to them to review, make sure they're happy with it. If they wanted to add, if they wanted to subtract, if they wanted to change something, it's pretty much all those quotes have been edited and approved by the individuals. That way we didn't get into some sort of issue like I never said that or, you know, and we just wanted to make sure it was extremely accurate to what their what they wanted to say. And that mm. was very, very, very important. This this book is written by Marshall and myself, but it's also written by 70 other people. And and it's a huge collaboration. We wanted everybody to feel it was a great um, a great presentation of themselves, a representation rather of, of every single person involved with this book. Absolutely. Now, Marshall, I do want to get into your experience writing the book because it seems mm -hmm. like once they, those interviews were compiled, then you were really uh, the spearhead to be able to go out and start to edit that and kind of start to formulate it along with Howard. But before I get there, you know, I got a chance to talk to Howard a couple of months ago and I hear mm -hmm. this like cinematic tale. There should be a script written about the boy on a bike going to Stan Winston studio at 12 years old, knocking on the door and that becoming his superhero origin story. But what What's your superhero origin story? How do you get involved in film, in critiquing, in editing? I know you've done, you, you spent a whole career in film. How did that happen? I just um, never felt like I was ever capable of doing anything else. I just never, it didn't, you know, real jobs, proper jobs, grown up jobs, I've always called them. They just seemed as, as beyond my uh, understanding and ability as, uh, you know, like I could jump to the moon or something. I'm just like, it just the only thing that I ever felt that I was ever really sort of um, good at was writing. And um, movies have always been like my first love. I mean, I was just, you know, film and, and TV and, and just general sort of fandom and collecting and that whole world of ours that we all love so much and that we're all sort of obsessed with and follow its teachings. And it's like, that was just always everything to me and so for me I mean I you know I grew up watching movies my mom was a huge movie fan um, my cousin was a few years older than me Ronald he was a collector he's a producer now um, it's just it, it just felt like this was the only thing that I ever wanted to be involved with and I know people have asked me like did I actually want to get into the business like on the inside mm -hmm. um, 
I, I, yes, I mean, that would be lovely, but really, I suppose I was, was always on the sort of appreciation side and I, and I just, so I just sort of stuck to my lane and uh, got, you know, when I was 16, I decided that I wanted to be a film critic. And uh, by the time I was 18, I was working for a, a, a London listings magazine. Um, you know, if people don't know what listings are, that's what they used to have in magazines, like what films, you know, what films were on in which cinemas and what times they were on. And it's like they're completely defunct now because obviously everything is online. But, you know, all of those magazines needed editorials. So it's like that was 18, 19, while a lot of my friends went off to university, I was going to... Um, you know, interviews and and living my dream and meeting my heroes and uh, you know it was just I was just completely drunk on that whole world really and on actual alcohol because as you know English journalists do like drinking and my first editor <laughs> was a colossal alcoholic so it's basically you know my friends would go oh Marshall you're missing out on university you know you should be coming here and because we can get a pint of beer for like twenty p. And I'm like, well, yeah, well, I was at this, uh, I was at the British Video Awards yesterday and I had a bottle of tequila with Kevin Peter Hall while he told me about playing the Predator. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I feel really bad that I'm not with you right now. And, you know, not that I wanted to be all boastful, but obviously I, I did a little bit. So I was just, it was just the only thing I could ever do. And I've been incredibly lucky that I managed to sort of, you know, hang on by my fingertips, always just sort of, you know, getting by in it. Really. Well, in what I love about the way you approach film is that because of that appreciation, you are a really good connection point to other fans like myself, who's really interested in film because you can see that passion and drive much like when you look at something like what Howard's doing, it's clear. I mean, literally you can physically see the passion and the drive that is in the end product that Howard puts out as well. So, um, but really quickly, just, I, we got to ask, uh, how he got involved in makeup and particularly I know creature of the black lagoon Howard was a huge point for you do you have one of those universal monsters or some other makeup that was just like oh my gosh like this is how is this possible on a human form is, is was there anything like that for you uh, early in your career oh well yeah look for me um I was um nine years old um when Star Wars came out and um I was absolutely primed by then you know I'd grown up from very small um, watching uh, every, every kind of movie. Um, so, you know, I, I, it wasn't like I was only into monster movies, but obviously I like monsters and sci-fi and horror, but I also liked Bob Hope comedies and, and you know, kind of vintage MGM musicals. And, you know, I just, it was just all sort of, sort of very incredibly beguiling. So I suppose, you know, I said it, before that I was sort of born nostalgic. It's like there was never a moment in my life when I didn't look back and think, uh, oh God, those, you know, they really made amazing movies back then. You know, I, I when I hear people today um, saying, oh, I don't like black and white films, then it's like, what are you talking about? You know, it's like, what are you talking about? It's like I, my, when my kids were small, I showed them all sorts of crazy stuff. And, you know, I, we, we watched, they were like five, six, and I showed them Metropolis and, uh, uh, you know, and it was like, but I did all the voices as well. I had to, you know, I had to add some entertainment layers to it, but uh, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's all about enthusiasm for me. Everything has just always been enthusiasm, but Star Wars was the thing that sort of consolidated it all. Um, I, uh, I was already a fan of a lot of things, but when Star Wars came out, and the thing about Star Wars in the UK, right, was that it came out in May in the US, 25th of May, 1977. So everybody gets this Star Wars summer, right? And and um, although it wasn't like today where you would, you know, see things online and you'd be incredibly aware of everything that was happening, and probably if it happened now, everybody would have downloaded it the next day and be watching it, in, you know, in England. But... You know, we it very slowly filtered through to England about Star Wars and the phenomenon and everything. But we had to wait seven months for it to come out in England. Seven months. So when people com complain uh, about, oh, no, I'm going to have to wait a week for the thing or it's going to it's coming out three days after it comes out in America or, you know, uh, or, you know, it's like, what are you talking about? I had to wait the best over half a year for star wars to came out yes yeah. and it came out in christmas so i said uh america had a star wars summer we had a chewbacca christmas and, and, yeah. I, and i was already a fan of it before it came out i had the posters i'd read the novelization like five times i was already giving it to my friends and saying pick page ask me a question quiz me you know it was That's like great 
but but then the moment it came out um my mom took to, took me to see it and um it was like it was like being born it was like honestly yes. that cinema was like a gigantic vagina and when i came out i was a different person that's, if that's not too graphic no no I no born, that's a, i was born and you know i remember coming out of the cinema right and there were these tables covered in merchandise and so not only was it like the most amazing film ever but it was also there were posters and t-shirts and programs and i've still got a ton of stuff that we got and so it was like everything about that whole experience just absolutely informed my whole life and i'm exactly the same i really have not grown as a person since i was nine you know honestly it, i it, I it, that's again it's that love of cinema that this really comes through in your work as well and i can't even believe that that you know it's not fair they film star wars over there and then it takes that long to get to you uh, i know you know, right to celebrate like a life day there right For i know sure. honestly i'm still incredibly bitter <laughs> um howard I know that like through reading the introduction, you get to meet Marshall sort of shortly after your Oscar win for Chronicles of Narnia. And then also you mentioned that this is a pandemic project. But what I like about the book is that it doesn't just focus on these legends and these amazing makeup artists. You get perspectives from all over the industry. Oh, yeah. Was that uh that was done clearly intentionally, but what yes. were your thoughts behind making sure that you get actors, directors, editors? You get so many different perspectives on this. Yeah, well, I think we we knew we wanted to cast a wide net, you know, and it just what I didn't want to only get the perspective of the makeup artist and the makeup effects artists, but I wanted to get and Marshall and I wanted to get the perspective, like you said, of, of editor Fred Raskin, who's a great editor, cuts all James Gunn's movies and, and Quentin Tarantino's movies or or, you know, uh, John Landis, you know, who is very much in, in you know, his films are very inspirational to us because, you know, I mean, American Werewolf and Thriller alone are, you know, two, two, two projects that inspired everybody. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to hear from actors, you know, I, I personally have worked with Ben Foster and James McAvoy, and they were both gracious to give us some time to talk in, in their busy, busy schedules. And that was great, you know, and, and Jane, and when we worked with, when I worked with James on Lion, Witch of the Wardrobe, that was his first really big movie. Yeah. You know? And we were together every single day. You know, I remember he was scheduled for 12 days and he ended up going like 32 days. So Tammy Lane, Sarah Rabano, who are both in the book and myself did his makeup for 32 days. And we were just so tight with James, you know. Um, but I wanted to get his perspective. I wanted to get Ben's perspective. I wanted to get my friend Blair Clark, who's a big VFX supervisor, his perspective and how it all works, you know, because they see things differently. You know, what's cool is they're all everybody's fans of makeup effects. That's the funny thing. Like you work with an actor. And um, I remember doing a movie called Way of the Gun that uh, Chris McQuarrie directed his first film that he directed. And Benicio Del Toro was in it. And I was on set and I just happened to be wearing a Creature from the Black Lagoon shirt. And he looked, and all of a sudden he looked at me and said, that's my favorite monster. And I went, what, the creature? Mm. He's like, all time favorite monster. And then we just started talking. He's a massive monster fan. Obviously he went on to do the Wolfman for Universal that Joe Johnson directed. And Rick Baker did all the great makeup effects for. But it's, it's fun to meet people that you don't expect. You know, and but everybody, it's like, oh, if I wasn't an actor, I'd be a makeup artist, you know, or if I, you know, wasn't this, I'd be a, I'd love to be an effects guy. Or, you know, I even had Mila Kunis, who I worked with on Oz the Great and Powerful. She's like, I want to come to set with you, but I want to be part of your crew. I want to do that gag. <laughs> and I'm like, just, hey, just let me know when you want to go to set. Obviously, it never happened because she's such a, a busy person, you know, with, with her family and with work and, and all her all the things that she does, which are wonderful. But yeah, she was like, I want to do blood gags. I want to just come and run all the blood pumps. I'm like, sounds good. Here, here's here's all these guys that are on my crew. Oh, and Mila Kunis. So it worked, you know, it'd be great. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that was the whole thing. We just wanted to make this very inclusive, you know, and, 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 uh, and also all the people we interviewed are from all over the world. It's not like, oh, it's just American makeup artists. Like we interview Nick Dudman and Barry Gower and Mark Coulier from the UK and David and Muncie from Spain. And, and uh, you know, I mean, Pamela Goldmare from, from, um, from Germany and, and uh, just all over the place, everybody, you know. And we've got the New Zealand contingent, of course. That's right, and New Zealand. Yes. Right, talking to Richard Taylor from Weta Workshop, you know, and, and um, thanks. Yeah, and then, I, but, you know, it's, I'm sure that there's obviously a lot of countries we didn't hit, 
if we, when we do volume two, we're already started. Our list. <laughs> we have a lot of countries to hit, That's but great. it's, it's great to just let everybody know. And, and also the book isn't just filled with like the superstars of our industry. There's people that are so vital and important to what we do. A guy named Rob Freitas, who does all, he's a great, great mold maker. I think probably the best mold maker there is without a great mold. You can't do anything. You can have a great sculpture and a crap mold, and then you're done. You're not going to produce what you had envisioned. Rob gives his wisdom on, on you know, what got him involved and interested. And again, it's not a how-to book. It's not, I didn't want to do that. I felt there was enough of those there. And I, I don't ever really enjoy reading them, uh, but I love to hear stories and I love to look at pictures. And, you know, matter of fact, when we were talking about John Landis, John's book, his monster book, which is outstanding, was really a, an influence. You know, I'm like, I want it to be as cool as John Landis's book. You know, and I feel that we have we've done that, you know, in the way the, the book is designed, the, the graphic aspect of it. It's very uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, Marshall and I spent a lot of time with uh, Ross, who was our editor and Russell, who was our um, designer from well back publishing uh, to really make that book exactly what we wanted. Like I wanted I wanted a book that that I wished I had when I was a kid that I could lay on my bed and just page through it for hours and hours and hours. And that's, that's this book. And there's so many stories behind it. It's funny. You mentioned that thing about uh, Mila Kunis and I was thinking about immediately. I went to, there's a section in there uh, where you're talking to the artist behind uh, game of Thrones and how he had to come up with the night King. And mm -hmm. it's like the end of the first season and they're thinking, Oh my goodness, how are we going to do this level of makeup when we go move forward? And then it just turns out that the crew just got huge because that show became huge. Right. And so they were able to really pump those out. So Mila could have joined the crew for, uh, for game of Thrones for sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I, and it's cool that you also mentioned James McAvoy, because what came through in that was his level of film geekiness. And so, Marshall, I'm wondering, you know, you're compiling all of these and you're compiling them from not only artists, but also directors and actors. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time that like there was just like a bit of like a nugget of wisdom or a story that stuck out from someone that wasn't maybe necessarily a makeup effects artist, but it really stuck with you. It was really poignant to you. Well, um, we did ask, um, you know, we spoke, <laughs> what I don't like from advice that I don't like from successful people is when they say, just stick at it. Um, uh -huh. and, you know, if you have enough faith and you have enough talent, if you just stick at it, you will succeed. It's like, that is not true. I know lots of really talented people who have, who have done it all their lives and who are just colossal not successful people you know just like you know they they find they enjoy and i've experienced a tremendous amount of that myself it, it's but you know none of that we didn't there were there were none of those sort of platitudes there's because you know if you have if you have your own experience of success and you stuck at it and you did achieve that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to achieve you know i mean it's just it's just not the case there's just not enough room at the top table for like everybody um but nobody gave that sort of level of advice. Everybody's advice was just really um, smart and useful, and, um, and 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 would inform anyone who wants to get on in whatever industry um, they they work in. And that's what I really liked. I mean, we had like you know twenty thirty percent of the people actually gave specific makeup things. You know, do this, don't do that. You know, but it, but I would say that the the the, the lion's share of the advice that we got that people shared that the, the you know the their wisdom was just about working in a team or getting on with people or you know not considering yourself the center of the universe and uh and and that stuff i think would apply to anyone in in, in any walk of life and i just really ap appreciated that just general there's not so much one thing as just there's just a lot of really smart advice about listening to other people um not beating yourself up but you know, considering other people's feelings and schedules, and um, it sounds sort of touchy feely, but it's, I, I, I just found that that I thought this is why these people are successful because, um, so they're not just saying something like there's some sort of magic trick to it. They're saying you know, 
pay attention to what other people want. Know that your your what you're doing is not the most important thing. It's not the only thing. That other people have their own worries and their own schedules. And uh, and it was about you know. And some people said, listen, I would rather hire the. Um, I can't remember who it said who said it now, but he said he would rather hire somebody who was like an okay talent but a good personality than someone who was um, had a horrible personality and was like a you know da Vinci. It was, it was just I, much I think rather... I said I think I said that, Marshall. Oh well, you said. See, <laughs> I said somebody incredibly wise, but, but that seems to me that you know they, they, they just seem like good life advice. That's why I think, and there's really no there's no making of. Um, aspect of it in terms of you know kind of how to um mm-hmm, obviously right. we go behind the scenes and we tell stories but it's more just um yeah i i, I think that uh, just the general sense of enthusiasm and, and and being sensitive to other people being aware of other people was the thing that i i kind of took from that and i think that's just good advice for anybody really that's great. Now, Howard, in the time that I've been able to research before interviewing the first time, and then also in the uh, short time that I've had the pleasure of getting to know you, you are a heck of a storyteller in addition to what you're able to do visually. And so I'm wondering, you get to kind of play a new role in this. You were sort of interviewer and journalist. Uh, and so I'm wondering if there was a fun story that was given to you that you will keep with you or that you heard that you wanted to mention to our audience. Just and I know you probably collected thousands of them, you know, or hundreds of them, right. but like, was there one that just really sticks out as like, this was a fun day, a fun interview, a fun moment to be able to part, be a part of? Wow. Yeah. I mean, they were all really, really fun. And, and yeah. I learned a lot. Like the, one of the things I loved most about doing this, the interview process was, I, I mean, I talked to people I've known for, you know, 30, 40 years, and I always came away with knowing, finding out something new that I didn't know about, you know, and, and, and discover. And um, you know, uh, Kazu uh, Hero, who is an uh, absolute brilliant makeup artist and a brilliant artist overall, not just the world of makeup, uh, won the Oscar for uh, Darkest Hour for the makeup he did uh, on Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill, and then won an Oscar for uh, Bombshell with Charlize Theron. He had a different take on things, which I really loved listening to. It was, it was, it wasn't about, I don't want to, I, I don't even know if if Kazu's a monster kid or a monster fan, but he just loves, I, I don't think he is, um, which is, doesn't matter. It's, it, it's, it's a whole nother world, but he's about creating like, you know, flesh and, and, and likeness and, and pushing the envelope, you know, to, to every which way. And just his perspective was so different than everybody else's. And, and, and I, again, there's somebody I learned a lot about during this conversation and just, you know, how he thinks about things and how he looks at things. And, um, you know, now he's, he's very much into the uh, digital age as we all are in the sense of, uh, you know, doing it the old way where we would life cast an actor, you know, put the goo on their head and all that stuff. We now do digital scanning and do outputting and he's really mastermind things like that. Um, another makeup artist, uh, Mike Marino, who's amazing, who, um, uh, was nominated for coming to America, doing all those spectacular makeups on Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall and the rest of the cast, and also did transform Colin Farrell into the Penguin for the Batman. Um, Mike had a lot of really interesting takes on things and how he how he approaches things and utilizes historic art uh, as inspiration. You know, where some of us might go like, "Oh, I, you know, the the apes in Greystoke are so amazing. I'm using them." Mike will go to the Metropolitan Art Museum in New York and sit there and and just look at you know sculpture and and take it in and draw and even sculpt while he's there. I've seen him there sculpting away, you know, uh, and really like training from the classical sense or, or do what he does from a from a classical art standpoint. So. I mean, all the stories are great. You know, I mean, there, there are crazy stories. Ken Diaz, who has been around forever and ever, has like, l- literally, it's like yippee ki stories. I'm like, what <laughs> the world of sports? How, are, how is that allowed? You know, nowadays, you, you know, you got to be so careful with every little teeny thing you do. But Kenny, it was like completely the wild, wild west back in the 70s and 80s. Oh, I loved his stories. His, his stories, stories are great. Yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't edit Kenny's stories down, so we just put them all in and there's I think Kenny has like four or five pages of stories you know the most stories probably next to Richard Taylor and and um 
Oh yeah, but his it, Mickey Rourke story is three pages long. Yeah, that's yeah, a page too, longer yeah. than anyone else's story. Yeah, that's it's true. The longest his relationship. <laughs> it's too epic. You could have yeah, done a yeah. whole book. Yeah, we couldn't. Yeah, we, we we could didn't have the heart to. We kept going like, should we trim it? I'm like, no. Marshall and I were like, we're not trimming it. It's staying the way it is because people will not believe it. It also was the story he tells is kind of an urban legend within our our community, and then this is verifying that the urban legend is not such a legend as it is a urban reality and uh that was cool to finally get the the truth of it between him and mick um but yeah i mean everybody brings so much to the table i we were so grateful to have everybody contribute you know and and we know people well we knew people were normally busy but we took advantage of of the shutdown in the film industry because i knew we could get a hold of every single person and everyone we reached out to was more than happy to participate you know be it bruce campbell be it aaron aaron uh mccash um you know todd mcintosh everybody i took advantage of every single buddy or every single person not having anything to do for five months and sitting in their home and and it was great and i think mm -hmm. uh and it might be really might have probably was fun for them too they got to do something <laughs> to break up their day and and then uh you know and then we hunted down photos we ended up collecting four thousand photos from everybody wow. that, was, that was the other thing too i don't want we didn't want the book to feel like the books you always see and they're always the same unit photos and this and that and so we went to each person and everybody was so great about giving us photos and we yeah. narrowed it down to a thousand photos in the book. Um, so we have 300, 3000 more. So there's three books right there. And, uh, and I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of words. I think the book is like 75,000, 80,000 words that Marshall. All together with all the captions. Yeah, all, definitely. Yeah. 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 So I got to say that as a journalist, um, I've, you know, I have done a few books before, nothing on this scale and nothing is this much fun. Certainly not as much fun to do. It's much more fun working with Howard than, you know, than sitting by myself, you know, kind of writing on something. It's, it just kind of created something that, um, you know, I think it's just really, really, um, really special. Um, if I was, if I had the idea and the audacity to try and do this book by myself, then I would have had to reach out to all these 70 people or probably I would have had to reach out to 300 people. Right. Um, because 90% of them probably wouldn't have even replied to me if I'd reached out to them. You know, I mean, the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's not just Howard's incredible knowledge and enthusiasm that made this book happen. It's that he knows everybody. And so it's like we had access to, and, and not only that, but that he had so much, um, people have love him and have so much goodwill uh, that, that they were, you know, they gave these wonderful unguarded interviews where, you know, we just heard stories that maybe they haven't told before, where they didn't slip into kind of like maybe, uh, you know, like that sort of journalist speak where, you know, you're interviewing somebody and you, you're getting the same sort of stories over and over again. And, it, you know, we talked long enough that everybody was sort of relaxed and enjoying themselves. You know, we only used the cream of everything. And then on top of which, can you imagine, um, if you're if you're interviewing people who aren't your buddies and then say now would you mind spending several more hours going through your archives and pulling out pictures that no one else has seen before that we can put in our book it's like i tell you that would just not have happened so it's like a maybe you know um you know uh, to my credit i chased howard for 10 years to start writing this book you know it's it's like i'm i i know that i contributed i know that you know i, I don't you know i think that we need each other to do this but it's because I don't know. I think it's just because of the, the time that we did it, and, and and because of what Howard brought to the table and what I brought, and, and just and with the, everybody was so um, cooperative and, and generous with their time and their pictures. And now in promoting it, wearing the t-shirts, talking about yeah. the book, sharing about it on their social, it's like I just it just feels incredibly um unique to me and i've read like howard you know a million movie books i've just got you know you can't see my book section but i've got plenty of movie books the other side of this um room is is very very booky and um you know to create something that that rivals my favorites that that sits alongside them comfortably it's like it's just really the most the proudest achievement of my that's whole so that's career. so great and I mean, really, uh, 
very nice of the two of you to uh, prop up some real up and comers like Guillermo del Toro and Seth MacFarlane to, you know, <laughs> right? We want to help the next generation. <laughs> those That's those, the thing. Name, those yeah, names that know. people may not yeah, recognize we were, at all. Yeah, right? we were trying to, yeah, trying to get people to be aware of those two guys because they are. <laughs> yeah. up and coming, so. yeah. I mean, we that, felt that was, like we shouldn't just have to hug them to ourselves, that right. the whole world deserves yeah. them. Right. I mean, that was another thing too, like when Marshall and I were talking about the forward and afterward, and I'm like, we got to see about getting getting Guillermo and and Seth. And I had just finished working with Seth, and he was so obliging. And he was always he when he sent it to me, he was he was so concerned. He kept you know calling and like, okay, so I, I just want to do it the right way. And you know, and I said, Seth, just write about what you think. You don't have to, you know, what was your first experience of seeing when you were a kid seeing a makeup and this and that. And and then he sent it. He's like, if it sucks, you can throw it out and I'll rewrite it. I'm like, you're Seth MacFarlane. You're a super genius. And then Guillermo, same thing. Guillermo, you know, was so busy in the middle of a hundred things and, and uh, you know, sent it to us. And he's like, here it is. And then he would 10 minutes later, no, 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 use this one. Oh, no, no. I just rewrote this. Use this one. So they really were so invested. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, I can have somebody else write it and hand it in. And um uh, it was really, really fantastic and how invested they were. And and I, I really feel so honored to have Guillermo, who's been a friend for so long, and I, I admire him so much. And then Seth, same thing, just such a great, great person and and so accommodating. And and um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's been wonderful. And and everybody yeah. that has seen the book, because Marshall and I got an advance of the, a couple of the copies of the books. And you know, I sent him to all my sisters. I have three sisters and, and my, my step parents and, and um, gave one to Greg Nicotero and, and um, people have just really, really loved it. And we didn't, Marshall and I haven't shared anything while we were writing the book. Nobody saw anything mm-hmm. like our wives, you know, my wife, Miriam and his wife, Ruda didn't see anything. And we just kept it to ourselves and just kept working and working. And you know, I didn't want to hear from anybody like, oh, maybe you should do maybe I don't want to hear that. I wanted to just do what we wanted to do. And then, you know, wait, and hopefully our wives thought it was super cool, which that luckily they did. They That's do. great. They do. Yeah. Now I have uh, a couple more questions I want to get through. I know that our time uh, is is fleeting here. And as I could listen to, I, I tell you, the interviews that you collected would make like the best podcast ever <laughs> you know, that they're yeah, not for would. that purpose, but it's just, so I know great. we have the zooms of all of them, but you know, obviously, <laughs> you know, everyone's in their pajamas. So we right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I, I do want to ask, uh, Howard and also uh, and also to Marshall, you know, one of the chapters I was drawn to, first of all, killer title of the chapter. Let's do the time warp again. I'm a huge Frankie fan. So thank you for the reference. But like the the old age makeup, because this really does have everything in it. This book covers so many different facets. Mm. Yes, it does have monsters. It has sci-fi. It has fantasy, but it also has just the the art of like making a human look so much different than they do in their true form. And you talk a lot about Dick Smith in that. And you talk uh, about all these other people that are just like amazing at this particular mm. craft. So Howard, I'll start with you. I know you are best known for fantasy monsters. Was there a genre in here that you uh, through these interviews, we're kind of like more interested in potentially even getting a handle on yourself or doing yourself at some point in the future? That's a good question. I mean, I'm fascinated by all of it. I'm really super inspired by everything. I love character makeup. So yeah, that that particular chapter, I really, really love a lot. And there's makeups in there that you know, I had not seen before, you know, uh, maybe they didn't end up being in the film, you know, uh, but, you know, we all love to, to, we were all inspired by Dick Smith. There's not one makeup artist I know who said, oh, I wasn't really a Dick Smith guy. That doesn't exist, you know, and, and, um, you know, it was really cool to see, you know, Neil Gorton is such a great, um, is so great at that, uh, you know, Mark Coulier, Kazu, of course, uh, Joel Harlow, um, you know, it keeps going on and on and on. And, and, and it was just, I don't know. I mean, I just, I love transformation. I love to see that, um, you know, the thing that, that also, you know, and I, we talk about this in the book or people talk about this in the book is the collaboration of the actor. So, you know, you can do a great makeup, but then if your actor doesn't bring it to life, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Amadeus is a perfect example on F. Murray Abraham, like Dick Smith yes. created a beautiful, seamless makeup that probably most people didn't even realize was a makeup. 
but F. Murray Abraham brought it to life. He utilized, if you watch that, those sequences, he's always doing something with his hands, bringing his hands up. And Dick spent a lot of time doing the hands as well. And he just knew how to utilize what Dick gave him. It was part of his acting tool, you know, and that's very important. I've had that a lot with actors and it's wonderful. Um, and Ben Foster and Jamie Kelman have a great partnership and they talk about it in the book. But yeah, I mean, it's, I just love seeing what everybody does. You know, Kevin Yeager's got a really specific touch about his aging. It's always beautiful and, and very natural. Um, it's hard because you know what, a, what a, a, somebody who's aged looks like. You know, if you make a demon or a monster or whatever, that's, that can be whatever, you know? It's, you know it's gonna be super cool, but you don't have a reference. Like that doesn't really look like a demon. But if you see an actor that you know in an age makeup, you, you know, you better be spot on. Greg Canham is another one, a master at aging. And, um, you know, it's just finding those things that are recognizable to the audience's eye. Like, oh yeah, that looks real. That looks real, you know? And it's, it's really about observation and, and, and being able to take what, you know, take that observation and, and put it into your makeup to, you know, sculpt it and create it. And then when you do the application. So uh, I I'm, I'm fascinated by all of it. I'm constantly learning through my career, I've been at this 40 years, you know, I've had my company K and B effects for 35, but I'm still learning, you mm -hmm. know? Um, uh, and, and yes, you're right. The book, you know, it's, it's not just a monster book. I mean, I, you know, we interviewed Vivian Baker who, who does prosthetic work, but she, she listen, the, the, she worked on, she won the Oscar for Bombshell with Kazu, along with Ann Morgan, who did all the wigs, but like those makeups, Kazu took it to a certain point and then Vivian took it to the next stage, like to create the, that Fox News makeup look, which is very, very specific. Vivian was able to apply, you know, her skills to then complete the makeup. So it's, again, it's all a partnership. It's all a collaboration. So yeah. I found that really interesting listening to what she said. I've learned a lot from Vivian Baker and, and uh, watching her doing things because she has a very specific way, you know, and, and, and I've, I've utilized certain techniques that she has on, in makeups I've done. And, um, but yeah, it's, 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 you know, I just, I'm just happy with all of it. I'm happy everybody, you know, we interviewed got in. I mean, the, the unfortunate thing is we, you know, we, we limited our time for, you know, how, how long we were going to interview, you know, months, you know, like from this month to this month. I and mean, then we got to start writing because we really we had to deliver the book at this point. And there's a lot of people I didn't get the interview. You know, there's a lot of people, but they're on the list for book two. Mm. uh which will ha hopefully happen uh if really. we'd done more though if we'd interviewed more people yeah. we didn't have more pages we had 320 pages That's to work true. in so if we'd interviewed another 30 people i mean that would have mm. been fun yeah. for us but it meant that everybody's everybody's um interviews they would have been cut a third off you know so right. it's like better to get the real meat of of 70 great interviews um and and then move on and and, and to do and to do another one I Got, just to add to what Howard was saying, I found that um, what uh, a lot of the makeup artists that we spoke to, um, the thing that they aspire to is creating makeups that actually nobody notices. Oh, it's yeah. like, like you know, when you look at like like how so when you look at a demon, um, number one, you you can make a demon look like anything. You know, nobody can say that's not what a demon looks like. But also, you know, you're looking at a makeup. It might be super convincing and realistic and amazing and fun and you're taken aback, but you know, you know it's in the realms of fantasy. When you see an old age makeup and you don't even realize that it's an old age makeup, like the movie X um, that was, you know, just out and, and the two, the elderly couple who, you know, goes on the killing spree. And those were, you know, two younger actors in age makeups. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of people watch that film and still don't realize that actually um, those were younger actors. People. And, I, and I know that having spoken to like, you know, dozens and dozens of makeup people that they love it it's like the ultimate magic trick if they can do a makeup it's one thing everybody's going oh that's the most amazing makeup but it's even better when people just see it and they come out and they'll go oh, you know there was a makeup guy what did they do you know it's like yeah. they don't even know because everything just looks like completely realistic and and so for them it's like their their peers know in you know in the business people recognize it 
But if you can pull the wool over people's eyes, if you can give them the complete experience where they don't even realize that what they're seeing isn't real, then I think that is that is the thing that really gets a lot of makeup artists excited. I absolutely. And the, again, this book has it all. And I can't wait to have a shelf where it's volumes two, three, four, five, you know, whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. As well. Absolutely. Now, you, I have, I've, nice. just, I've just got another uh, uh, minute or so here with you. And I want to tell you how much uh, FOMO I have being stuck here in the Midwest that you're going to come over, Marshall, and be able to promote this book along with Howard. You've got some really cool events coming up in LA uh, in September. And so I just wanted to, you know, like much like you being birthed out of the cinema during Star Wars, you're now- Sorry, that was a very book. graphic image. No, I that's apologize. okay. It was perfect. <laughs> you are now birthed uh, this book out into the world. Are you excited to go and promote it and maybe just talk a bit about those uh, just for a few seconds here about the uh, events you have coming up? I'm, I I could not be more excited about it. And, and I think that everybody is, is really going to enjoy them. After spending two years working, um, you know, here in, in London, in, in this one room surrounded by my stuff, um, you know, in my pajamas. And then it's like to actually put on some big boy pants and to come out into the world and to, you know, hang out with Howard and, and to meet all the people that we spoke to and to give everyone else a chance to come and meet them too. It's just... Um, uh, you know, it is, it is beyond my wildest dreams. It's going to be the 10 best days of my life. But Howard is That's much so better great. than me at uh, reciting off all the events. So, so Howard, you should hit it, hit it. All right, I will. I'll hit it real quick. So, yeah, if anybody's in the L.A. area in September, the week of uh, September 18th. So September 18th, we're doing a signing at a really cool place called Dark Delicacies, which is in um, Burbank, California, off of um, Magnolia and uh, Hollywood Way. And that's going to be from three to five. And there's going to be something like 20 to 22 contributors uh, signing books. So you want to uh, hop on Dark Delicacies um, uh, website and order your book and uh, or you can purchase it there but um th to guarantee you'll have a book uh like 25 signatures you yeah, know wow. in, signatures. from then, one session amazing right. then on the 23rd of september uh we're going to be uh doing a presentation at uh the ricardo montabon theater which is on in hollywood on vine street and we'll have a bunch of contributors there we're going to do a q a and talk about the book and show a bunch of behind the scenes things and then have a signing and then uh sunday september 25th we will be signing at the academy museum this is a really exciting one we've got yeah. about 12 contributors coming so 12 signatures uh from people in the book and um that will be from one to three and the academy theater is right there on museum row the miracle mile uh um, fairfax and and wilshire so um they're all great events we're super excited about them um you know uh, and then and then i get to go to london to visit marshall in november and we've got a, a bunch of events coming up which we'll announce that but starting uh the week of um november 10th on mm -hmm. uh until the 17th we'll have events in in london uh That's like great. planet and and some other stuff will be coming up but we'll be posting all that on our social well, I yeah, know you can uh, actually have a look on our website because we there's just so much going on that we had to kind of have one place where everybody could go to. So if you go to masters and makeup effects dot net, um, everything is there, including you can get merch. There's links to all the different bookshops um, selling the book. There's um, all our podcasts. There's um, pictures of all the monster kids everyone has worn a t-shirt we just have this just endless amazing running thing of people wearing our t-shirts and showing showing the book and uh, and also all of our signing events there's links to everything there so it's a good kind of all-purpose link masters of makeup effects net go there kids well this has just been an amazing time to get to speak to both of you thank you so much for the book you know my birthday is coming up on september 20th i should go watch uh go check southwest for some plane tickets right now i think to get out to those events but it's yes. just been wonderful thank you howard for two interviews for all yeah. your time and thank Thanks. you for your work you do with the academy marshall thank you for the art and creativity you continue to put out into the world too it just makes us all more whole so so thank you oh. both of you that's very kind. So that Thank was great fun. Much. Thank you. Awesome. Well, sorry you got a couple minutes late there, but uh, oh, it's all good. You're good. Don't worry about it. It's all good, yeah, man. It was great. Yeah, and Whatever I'll get this. Get um, so I'm going to get this turned around and then certainly I will email you uh, back once I have it. And then, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for everything you do. And the thank book you. truly is amazing. It's just incredible. Oh.
Thanks, my friend. Well, thank you so much yeah. for everything you've done. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's well, so nice to meet you, Marshall. Nice yeah, have a good day. Yeah, have a good day. Have a great weekend, Craig, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, will do. All bye. right. Bye, guys. Bye. Marshall. Yeah, bye, Howard. Bye. See ya. I could literally talk to those two for hours <laughs> and uh, it's so I'm so grateful for their time and especially Howard who has already t- yabbered with me once before and gave me uh, just the his time is so valuable and so to get a bit of that is just so amazing and also Marshall to be able to really talk to somebody who has made a career of kind of their fandom and their passion for film is also just really inspiring for this Midwestern podcaster to be able to talk to somebody like that. It was cool to hear some of the stories that they had about the people and the individuals that they were able to interview and that they really valued their time just as much as like I value these two's individual, the their two individual times uh, when putting this interview together. So it's just great to get a chance to chat with them. As uh, Marshall mentioned, you can find their website and that's mastersofmakeupeffects.net. So go and check that out. You should absolutely go and pick up this book. If you are a film fan, this book will not disappoint at all. There's so many tidbits and stories in here that you can just kind of, it's one of those books where you could really just turn to any individual page and learn something or have like a fun experience reading through that story. And I hope that they do several more volumes of this moving forward because it really is just a a great love passion project all about makeup effects and every just about every aspect you'd want from makeup effects so uh, congratulations to them if they happen to be listening back just thank you so much for your time it means so much to me and thank you for your talent and putting this book out in the world i can't wait to continue to read it and to get like even more tidbits as i go throughout the rest of the book that i haven't uh, had a chance to check out fully yet it's going to be amazing and if you're in the la area Go to one of those events because oh my gosh I can't I'm go for me because I'm gonna miss out on them and I'm already uh, having that FOMO uh, getting to not be able to be out there in LA and go through that Academy Museum and get that signing that all just sounds so incredible so thank you again for their time and if this happens to be your first time listening to a front row network show i am actually the host of a couple of different shows on our network i host a weekly disney show called beyond the mouse i also host a pretty much weekly ted lasso show Uh, we are taking a bit of a break at the moment only because we are waiting for season three to get started but uh, that's called peanut butter and biscuits we also have shows uh, ranging all different types of film from classics to those flashback films of the 80s 90s and early 2000s We also have uh, things like Guilty Pleasures and so many other shows that you should go and check out for sure uh, on the Front Row Network feed, but then also on our all individual feeds as well. You can just go ahead and follow the Front Row Network on any social media platform just by searching for us there and let us know what you think about this interview and let us know what you think about this book once you pick it up, because I'll tell you, it is the perfect gift for anybody that is interested in film. It's also just, uh, it's just incredible. I'm, I'm kind of like leafing through the pages here and it's just the pictures that you see are just brilliant and beautiful. It, it, everything about it is just great. I can't say uh, enough kind words about this. So, uh, I will go ahead and stop gushing all over these two. Thank you so much for their time. Thank you to listening and giving me your time uh, whenever you're listening to this podcast. I really appreciate it. So for the front row network, this is Craig. And we will see you real soon in the front row, hopefully in the front row of uh, maybe some kind of makeup convention, makeup uh, appreciation, uh, because truly it's incredible the work that these individuals do. So thank you. 